if you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. Yeah, we can definitely do that, or we could be better clinicians and use our ultrasound. Jacob, the people have spoken. They love your ultrasound talks, but they want more. They want oh something gosh. new and different. New and different. Yes, that sounds awesome. Something other than lung. Amazing. I can't wait. On this week's podcast, Jacob Avila is recording the talk he made at Smack Dublin. It's on airway. Finally, something other than lung. I don't know about you, but I've had all the lung ultrasound I can handle over the last few months. So here it comes, a whole new lecture, no lung ultrasound whatsoever. Let's do it. I know we've got some uh, hot stuff planned and coming up. I know Mike's dying to get back to cardiac ultrasound. But today, we'll get there eventually. I think you want to talk about airway ultrasound, right? We've kind of yeah. talked about this a little bit occasionally, but we haven't really dove that deep. So let's talk about it again. Hold on, really? Are you guys recording in a hotel room? This is while you were in Colorado doing those edibles. I mean, that ultrasound course, right? Matt, why are your eyes so red? Whatever. The hotel room's really classy, fellas. Nice work lowering the bar. Yeah. Let's do it. Um, now, Matt, I know I don't normally do this, but do you mind if I go through a couple of cases with you? Actually, can I just go through one case? Just one case? Absolutely. Now, what I want you to imagine is I want you to imagine this guy that comes in. It's an MVC. He was all alone, and he happened to lose control of his vehicle and hit a tree. And he comes in as a mildly hypotensive, mildly tachycardic trauma patient. What do you do? So, ABCs. Like it. Um, what, what are my ABCs? Well, all right, I'll tell you. His airway is patent. He is breathing. But the problem is, is he's actually in a good amount of respiratory distress. So you got your ABs and Cs, okay. You don't need to intubate him right now? You don't need to intubate him. He's okay. having pretty good, though. Um, and he's awake, but he just seems like he's kind of struggling a little bit to breathe. He's kind of kind of breathing a little heavy, a little fast. And so something's off, even though your ABCs are good. Your vitals are, like I said, maybe a heart rate of 105, maybe a blood pressure like... Mm, 105, something soft. What did the CT scan show? Well, the CT scanner is actually broken. Oh, oh that's yeah. tough. Um, so after my ABCs, all right, let's figure out what's going on. Why is he short of breath? Let's do an extended fast exam. Yeah, so let's start with the fast exam in the abdomen. What Tip do you see of the here? Liver looks nice. I don't mm-hmm. see any fluid. Morrison's pouch, nice and clean. All right, let's move on He's here. He's moving over to the bladder. Nice mm-hmm. sagittal orientation. Mm-hmm. I like that. And looked clean. So what do you think is left upper quadrant, Matt? It looks good. It looks yeah. Normal. I've been emphasizing lately to make sure to look at the pericolic gutter on the left side. so a little further down here. But let's just assume that the fast was negative. All right. So the next step is to look for a pericardial fusion. Should we do that first? Okay. All right. So we stick that probe in the sub xiphoid area and we get this image right here. Pretty clean. No effusion. Agree. Agree. All right. So what's next? What are we missing for the EFAST exam after we've done the, ab- the abdomen? We've Checked for a pericardial effusion. What's next? Come on, really? You guys are going to sell me on an airway podcast and then talk about lung pathology? Didn't we just do this for like 17 months in a row? We get it, man. You like the lungs. Jeez. Maybe the lungs. All right, I like it. Let's move on to the lungs here. So I'm going to look up in the lungs, and I want you to tell me what you see here. It looks like we've got a probably a pneumothorax, and we see no sliding in one. So we see sliding on the other. So the slide, sliding where there's no sliding, since this is a young mm-hmm. trauma patient, I'm going to assume that's a pneumothorax. Absolutely. And especially if they have, like, physical exam findings that are concerning for, like, they have a seatbelt sign or something like that, they have a flail chest or something weird, that's definitely enough to consider that the patient has a pneumothorax. Now, the only issue with that is that let's say that the patient comes in and they have kind of <laughs> Finally, Matt shows his excitement with lung ultrasound as well. No offense, Jacob. I'm sure it was just the edibles talking. Poor lung sliding on one side, and what you think is the absence of lung sliding on the other side. Is that always going to be a pneumothorax, the absence of lung sliding? Didn't we just talk about this for like 10 podcasts in a row? Right. Okay. So pneumothorax is definitely one, but you have adhesions, obstructive airways, disease, apnea, main stem. Those all can cause the absence of lung sliding. This is what you need. A little space repetition. What do you see here? That looks like a lung point. Mm. So a lung point is extremely highly specific for pneumothorax. Not 100% though. All right, perfect. So you did a good job on that one. Strong work, Matt. So remember, pneumothorax, make sure that you position the probe in the adequate place. You want to actually stick the probe probably a little further down than you're used to. Rear space is five through eight because if they're laying down flat, that's where air is going to accumulate. Pick the linear transducer if you can but the curvilinear transducer will work as well lung sliding rules out a pneumothorax lung point rules one in now uh i didn't really like that case matt it's too easy and plus we already talked about pneumothorax why don't we just why don't let's just you know what let's just do this one completely over again let's rewind 
Let's go back to the beginning of the case and let's let's do it kind of a different scenario. Same patient. It's a trauma patient, comes in, single vehicle MVC, hit a tree. And the regular fast is negative. So there's no blood in the peritoneum and no pericardial fluid. But you see this on your physical exam. Seatbelt sign. Mm. Seatbelt sign is definitely concerning, especially if somebody that's a little bit unstable. But you see this. You see bilateral lung sliding. Okay. All right. So no pneumothorax, right? So the patient is doing a little bit better. You gave him some fluids, gave him some pain medicine, and his, his vital signs have gotten a little bit better, but the patient's still complaining of a significant amount of pain. So you stick the transducer over that area that you see the bruise, and you see this right here. This is, these are focal B lines. Now, B lines, B lines, that is only present in CHF. Why are we seeing it here? Is it uh, because it's actually present in any increased density state, and you're showing me a lung contusion? Mm, I'm so proud go of you. along with the C belt sign? True. That's very true. So pulmonary contusions can definitely show up. B lines are thought to be sensitive and C lines are thought to be more specific. Contusion lines? What is C lines? You have to explain that. Yeah. So C line is something that somebody invented to mean contusion. So C line is kind of a contusion and basically it's just a subpleural consolidation. The B lines are thought to be more sensitive, good for ruling out. And this specific finding is going to be more the subpleural consolidation here. So you have to run out of the room. You have to take your ultrasound machine with you. And in the meantime, one of our amazing trauma surgeons makes it down to the ED and can't talk to you. And they end up getting a chest x-ray because they want to make sure the patient doesn't have any more thorax. So on this chest x-ray, I don't see any more thorax. I don't even see that pulmonary contusion. And I definitely don't see really anything else that's causing this guy's chest pain. You ask the patient, can you please put the probe where it hurts? And they stick it right here. What do you see? Well, first off, all the trauma surgeons I know are smart enough to just do the ultrasound themselves. I don't know who you <laughs> It's a hypothetical. I don't know. It happened years ago when I was a med student in a different institution in a different state. So what was your question? <laughs> My question is the patient's complaining about pain right over the sternum. The chest x-ray didn't show a fracture, but you put an ultrasound machine on it, and what do you see? Um, I'm guessing there's a fracture. Mm -hmm. Where's the fracture? It looks like where the cortex is disrupted. Here? That looks more like a joint. How can you tell the difference between a, a joint and a fracture? Well, one, you know where the joint is on the body. Right. And you put the probe over top of it. Sternum and joint. joint right there. Um, it also looks a little smoother and mm -hmm. like it's supposed to look like that. I don't know what the description is. So usually the way that I do it is I ask myself, can I draw basically a contiguous line between the two? And if I can, I consider that a joint. Now I want you to compare that kind of that you can draw that smooth line over top of it. Compare that with this thing over here, the cortex right there. You cannot draw a straight line and connect those two tips. Yeah, you can. Why did you say that? What do I say now? <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> All right, we'll just, just keep going. Um, and the patient also states that their side is hurting a little bit. And you stick that transducer on there and you see this. Normal or abnormal, Matt? Mm, it looks like a broken, broken rib. Yeah. Broken rib. So you see the cortex here. You see a break in that cortex and right here. And on this particular patient, this patient had a little bit of extra fluffiness. And so the only way to get to the rib sometimes is to use that curvilinear transducer. So you can use the linear or the curvilinear transducer. So to recap, if you have a fracture, you want to look at the cortex, see if it's contiguous, and be careful with the joints. Contusions, B lines are sensitive, and C lines are specific. You know what? I didn't like that case either. Let's rewind. I want to do it again. We, can we do it again? Can't wait. Can't wait. All right. Same patient. The fast is negative still. And you see this. You see this on the left side. So you see the diaphragm here, right? You see the spleen here, kidney, and you see this structure up here. And you're concerned that the patient might have a hemothorax. Well, if he had a hemothorax, you'd see that spine continuing there. Right. Yeah, exactly. You don't see it. And you see a mirror sign, right? We talked about this in previous podcasts. If you see a similar echotexture above and below the diaphragm, you have air in the thorax. Now, on the right side, you see this. Now, this is definitely different. You have the, you have the liver here, you have the kidney here, and you have your spine sign extending all the way past. You've lost that mirror sign, and you can even see this lung right here. So to recap, when you're looking at a pleural effusion, there's two things you want to look for, the mirror sign and the spine sign. The mirror sign is when you have similar echo textures above as you do below the diaphragm. If you see that, there's air in the thorax. The spine sign, you want a negative spine sign. That rules out 
a pleural effusion. Now the spine sign, you're going to see those spine cortices. And if you see it stop at the diaphragm, the patient does not have anything that can transmit sound to the thoracic vertebral bodies. And there's one other sign I didn't really talk about too much called the plankton sign. The plankton sign is this. You see all those little, almost like little pieces of plankton within that pleural effusion right here? Absolutely. So if you see this, the patient likely has an exudative effusion. If you don't see that, however, the patient can have a transudative or an exudative. So this rules in an exudative effusion. But if you don't see these little internal echoes, these little plankton-looking things, the patient could have a transudate or an exudate. Matt, I didn't like that. I didn't like that case. Can we do it again? I hated it. Yeah, Absolutely. We really need to do it again. All right, let's rewind. So the same patient, the fast is negative. And when you're trying to evaluate the thorax, you see this instead. What is going on here? Is that the plural line? What does the plural line look like that? Um, it is kind of strange looking. Let's, uh, let's play it again. Can't, like, I feel like there's comet tails, so right. no normal thorax. Right. But didn't I see sliding and shimmering? All right. Now, the, the one thing i got to ask you is, where is this plural line in relation to the rib, which is right here. Well, yeah, I was going to say, we could didn't really see a really good rib at first, but now that we see the rib yeah. over there, kind of peeking in on the screen, it looks like the plural line is above. Is this is like a normal variant? No, 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 it's not a normal variant. Typically, the ribs are actually outside of the lungs, not inside the lungs. What we're seeing here is something called subcutaneous emphysema. When you see the subcutaneous air tracking along the subcutaneous layers and actually blocking you from getting to the pulmonary parenchyma, basically all you can say is the patient has subcutaneous emphysema. You can't say the patient has a pneumothorax for sure. You can't say they have a contusion. If you see this fake pleural line above the ribs, the, remember, the only thing you can say is subcutaneous emphysema. And usually that entails the patient having a pneumothorax, but you can't definitively rule one in or rule one out when the patient has subcutaneous emphysema. So just be careful with that. All right, now I'll do the same case. And you see this. So this is that same patient that comes in a little bit in distress. I mean, do you need an ultrasound? For this aliens about to burst out of this guy's chest yeah this is a gnarly flail chest that i saw off of uh, i think it was on facebook actually that i got this video i don't know who but this is intense right so you have this an obvious flail chest and the patient is in significant respiratory distress like the respiratory rate is like 55 their heart rate's 150 their blood pressure's 80 you don't really need to mess with the ultrasound. You know that the patient likely has a tension pneumothorax and you need to get a chest tube and you need to protect that airway. Now you've made the decision that you need to intubate the patient, but an off-service intern is seeing the patient with you and you go ahead and they really badly want to do this intubation. You say, okay, go ahead. And they go ahead and get ready as, as well they can. And you only have DL at your shop, Matt. You only mm. have DL. So you can't see exactly what's going on with that tube. You can't see if it's going in the esophagus. You can't really see if it's going in the trachea. And you get nervous and you don't want to wait until you do a couple of bags to figure out if it's in the right place or not. So instead, you stick your ultrasound transducer. And what's awesome about this is that I happen to be able to see through the eyes of that off-service intern. So I'm going to show you what the intern is seeing and I'm going to show you what you're seeing with your ultrasound. So there you have beautiful cords. And then over here, you have the ultrasound image. This is trachea right here. You see how there's one kind of circle right there? There's just one ring. Uh-oh. Uh do you see this second kind of weird air mucosal surface form right here? I do. If you see two air mucosal interfaces like you see right here, then you can be pretty sure that whoever has intubated the patient has in fact intubated the esophagus and not the trachea. So you know that he has in fact intubated the esophagus. And before you wait to bag, before you do anything else, you tell the intern, you know what, you're in the esophagus. I see two air mucosal services. Would you mind trying again? So he goes ahead and pulls that endotracheal tube out of the esophagus, goes a little more superior and you can see right here, you have a little bit of kind of changes in artifact within this trachea. And you only see one air mucosal surface right here. This patient now has the endotracheal tube in the trachea where you want it. So you can actually do this in a direct ultrasound guidance. And this is especially useful if you have someone else intubating and you're kind of supervising it. Probably the best place to put it so you're out of the way is actually in the suprasternal notch. But you can basically put it anywhere that you need to. Jacob, I find a lot of people when they first do this, they put the probe down and they have a hard time really seeing like what's what, where's the esophagus and stuff. Sure. What tips do you have? 
on identifying the esophagus before this procedure actually happens. Yeah, that's a really good point. And in order to be the most accurate at this, the best way to do it is to actually, before the intubation, go ahead and visualize the trachea and go ahead and visualize the esophagus. Now, on this particular patient, the esophagus, you couldn't really see it very well. Often, it will be this little kind of flat, oval-shaped structure that is either going to be on the left or on the right side of the patient. But sometimes it's a little bit hard to get a good view. Sometimes you're going to get lucky and see something like this. We have a really good trachea right here, air mucosal surface. And you see this weird oval right here? This is the esophagus. Now, there's two ways that you can make this pop out more. One of them is to actually put a little bit of pressure on the trachea itself, and that will sometimes kind of squeeze out the esophagus so you can see it. Another thing that I'll do as well is instead of going right over the suprasternal notch midline, I'll go laterally and try and push and see if I can have the esophagus pull push out a little easier that way. I think both of those work great. To me, the easiest thing, what I do now is if you put the probe, supersternal notch, midline, the esophagus is usually going to be behind it. But all you have to do is slide the probe all the way over here lateral. And then even though the esophagus is directly behind it on the screen, you see trachea and esophagus because you're looking at them like this instead of this. Right, because that that air will block that sound from getting to the esophagus. And if you go beside it, then the air is going to be blocking the other side of your neck, not behind. So you'll be able to see that esophagus better. Exactly. <sighs> That's, that was amazing. So what probe do you prefer? Well, you can use either the linear or the curvilinear transducer. They both work. A lot of people like the linear, and a lot of the research out there actually uses the linear transducer. And when you get images that look as good as this image right here, then the linear would be probably better. The problem is, is that a lot of our patients that were having issues with intubating or they're concerned about might have kind of thick necks and it's difficult to get a higher resolution image. So what I do is I use a curvilinear on most, if not all of my patients that I'm doing this on. I just get a better bird's eye view and I feel like I can actually see the esophagus better with a curvilinear transducer. Yeah, I think most people when they first do this assume you're going to use a linear probe because you're looking at superficial structures and you're used to the linear probe in the neck and that's how I started out, but it's just so much easier with the curvilinear probe. Decrease the depth a little bit, come to the side of the curvilinear probe and you see it perfectly. Yeah, I agree. So here's another example, and this is one using a linear transducer. So pay attention to this one air mucosal surface right here and the esophagus over here. You can see that the first attempt was not quite as successful. We already see something going on in the esophagus right there and there, boom. Now you see two, it looks like two tracheas. Two tracheas. I want two tracheas. So then here's the example of it happening the right way. And you can see that the esophagus stays down here and it stays in that oval shape. And you have a little bit of change in that artifact within the trachea. If you see this without that second air mucosal surface, then you're good. You're in the trachea. So the next question, though, is where is the tube? Once you see it go through the trachea, you're just going to wait for the x-ray? Or do you have any special ultrasound magical tips yeah. to know how deep the tube is? I do. The way that I like doing it the most is basically you take 10 cc's of normal saline of sterile water, and instead of using air to inflate that endotracheal balloon, you use the normal saline. And what you see is something like this. And this is you sticking the probe in the suprasternal notch. So you can see this balloon start to get a little bit bigger, and you see all these air bubbles. And this is a fluid-filled endotracheal balloon right here. Where's your probe exactly right here? So to get this view and to make sure it's in the adequate spot, your probe has to be in the suprasternal notch. And if in the suprasternal notch, you see see that balloon inflate, you're usually within that two centimeters of the carina. Some studies out there have actually not done saline. They'll still use air and they look for basically any kind of dilation in the trachea. So real time, the trachea gets a little bit wider. That's what they use. But for me, that's kind of a subtle sign and I'd much rather see the balloon itself. So that's why I use the saline. If you're interested in this a little more, we do have this podcast specifically on this that we did with Mark Tesaro, who's the author of um, one of the only papers on this. Yeah, it's, it's where I got the information for this, actually, was Tessero's paper. All right, so Matt, now let's take that same patient, the one that has that flail chest, you have to intubate them. You position yourself at the head of the bed, you tell the patient to open their mouth. Now, you have no ENT in-house, and you have no equipment to open up this mouth, and you don't even know what kind of surgery this patient has. No, it's had. not actually a grill, though, right? It's just wired shut. It's wired shut, probably from surgery. So you realize after seeing this that there's no way that you're going to be able to intubate this guy through his mouth. You don't really have the experience nor the equipment to do a nasopharyngeal intubation. So your only option here is really to do an emergent crike. You look down at the neck and you see this neck, basically a neck that is impossible to palpate any kind of landmark. So what are you going to do, Jacob? So I can't palpate correct landmarks on this guy. So I'm going to use my ultrasound to figure out exactly where to go. Now, the first thing is you're going to stick that probe in a vertical orientation. So basically a sagittal cut 
on that patient's neck and you're going to look for the cricothyroid membrane. I'm going to pause it about right here. So right here we have the thyroid cartilage and beneath that we have this really straight bright white line. This is actually air. So if this, you have your probe marker facing up. So if this is the thyroid, this air surface right here is going to be the cricothyroid membrane. This is going to be your goal. So bring it a little bit this way so that that cricothyroid membrane is actually in the center of the screen and then you're going to mark that on the patient just like this. So you have one axis mark. The second thing you're going to do is you're going to look and find out where midline is. So you basically put the transducer basically anywhere in the neck, find the center. So the center would be kind of the top of this little arch right here. So center is probably about right there and then mark it there. And after you've done that, you basically have these crosshairs that you know exactly where the cricothyroid membrane is. And if you just go straight down, you'll be able to make it into that area. I think this is a great practice to do, even if you don't think you're going to have to crack a patient. If it looks like it's going to be a difficult intubation, I think it's really nice to do this. And the reason being, because I think the biggest mistake we make in Christ a lot of time is doing them too late. And the reason we do them too late is because it's a scary procedure. We don't want to. Just a little bit more confidence saying you know exactly where you're going to cut if you need to is probably going to make you a little more willing to go ahead and get in there make right. the decision. So I think this is a great thing to do on any patient you predict is going to be a difficult intubation. If you don't really think you're going to need to cry them, just having it there is going to give you that confidence to go ahead and make the cut if you need to make the cut. Jacob, that was great. Um, if someone actually wanted to learn this, get some hands-on training though, have you actually show them where you put the probe, right. what you do with it, where could they do that? Well, there's this conference we're doing, right, in Cabo? Cabo Fest 2016. Actually, I probably should have clarified. Um, by the time this is released, I don't think there's going to be any more Cabo spots or maybe a couple. But if you miss out, you may try CastleFest2017.com. Wait, the castle hasn't sold yet? No, it's not sold. So we're doing Castle Fest again. We'll keep doing it as long as we're able to do it. It's an awesome time. We really love doing it. Um, and we're going to give you more information about it soon. But we just put the website up, CastleFest2017.com. We'll let you know more later. In the meantime, go scan yourself. Look at what your esophagus and trachea look like. Look at your cricoid membrane. Think this stuff through, and the next patient you come in that may need it, you'll be ready. If you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs. Let us know how you feel about it. Yeah, we can definitely do that, or we could be better clinicians and use our ultrasound. They know that I need the right electricity to move my disco feet. They know that I need a rhythm of ecstasy to get the disco feet. Baby, give me the song that keeps rolling on along until the break of dawn. Baby, give me the one, cause we like to get it done. Tomorrow comes So don't let Don't turn back Cause we can feel The funky groove Baby don't distract Lose contact Cause we believe You got the rules And baby You seem to wonder why We drive in this go right You know I don't I won't get it down You seem to wonder how My funky vicious love You know I don't you know I won't fail